Let us give our minds and hearts to meditation on the 47th Psalm this afternoon, which I've entitled, Praise the Sovereign God. Psalm 47, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us. The excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. Amen. 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 That's the psalm. This psalm is a revelation to us of the the true and living God in, in, in words. And it uses the analogy of a king, that is a supreme ruler over subjects, to help us grasp who God is. Although, I hasten to add, the analogy breaks down. It's not a perfect analogy, or it wouldn't be an analogy. Um, for example, earthly kings die, but God is eternal, though he is portrayed as a king here. <laughs> earthly kings have wisdom. God is wisdom. Wisdom is not some add-on that God possesses. God is wisdom itself. Earthly kings may rule justly, God's rule is necessarily just by virtue of his being God. Earthly kings wield influence indirectly. God's power is direct and absolute. Resistance is ultimately impossible. Earthly kings make and break promises by deceit or defeat. But God's word is true and omnipotent. God's word is inviolable. His promise cannot be broken. And and so the, God is king like, but he is in a different order altogether from earthly kings, although like them in some respects. Therefore, Praise is justly due to this sovereign God, and he ordains such praise. Psalm 47 calls us all to join in praises, even singing praises to this sovereign God. We are called by this hymn or psalm uh, to participate in the joyful musical worship of of the Lord, who is the King of Kings. And, and this tends, by the way, to the display of his glory and to our blessedness. If we hear the call and answer by obedient praises. As it is my custom, I have uh, formed a main point of the scripture passage. And I think for Psalm 47, it could be put this way. Let everyone praise the sovereign God who promises and performs. 
That's how simple the message is. Let everyone praise the sovereign God who promises and performs. And by my statement, I mean to highlight the two major parts of this psalm. And they're separated by the word Selah in the text at the end of verse 4. Selah, we don't know the exact meaning of the original term, at least I don't, but it seems to indicate, sometimes at least, uh, to take a break and meditate on what you've just sung in the psalm. And so that may be a natural marker of, of a division in the psalm. I think it is. I say that <coughs> I say there are two major parts of the psalm because also that there, there is a discernible three stage progression in the first part, verses one to four, and the second part, verses five to nine. A three stage progression, and here's here are the three stages. Worship him, an exhortation to worship him. Secondly, an announcement that he to be worshipped is king. And thirdly, an announcement that he who is king acts in a kingly manner. And actually, these are the connection of, of a duty with reasons. Praise the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is the sovereign God, the King of kings, and He acts kingly in keeping with His sovereignty. That's why. So this three-stage progression, I think, is discernible in the first part and also in the second part. But there's a difference between part one and part two of the psalm. In the first part... You may notice if you're paying attention and you're discerning that we have a couple instances of of future tense verbs, especially in verses three and four. We read, he shall subdue the people under us. And in verse four, he shall choose our inheritance for us. And this seems to suggest um, a promise made to the people and celebrated in the psalm of God's gracious intentions toward his people, his gracious purpose. But in part two, starting with verse five, we have rather present tense verbs. For there we read that God, in verse eight, God reigns, present tense, over the heathen. God sits Upon his throne. The the princes of the people. Are gathered together. And so forth. In other words. um, The promises made in the first part of the psalm. Are realized. And celebrated. In the second part of the psalm. So. I'm proposing as an outline. This whole psalm is. Is uh, entitled. Praise the sovereign God. In my sermon. And uh, the sovereign God, number one, is the king who promises, verses one to four. And he is the king who performs. That is, he keeps his promises and delivers what he promised. Verses five to nine. Now, the verbal substance of the psalm is fairly straightforward. So there's no need to belabor the sense. But uh, my plan is to work through the exposition verse by verse, as we usually do. And then to show you how this fits into the grand biblical mega story of, of redemptive history that finds its, its focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But first we must appreciate what these words mean in the psalm by what they say. And so we start with verse 1. And to To paraphrase the substance of the verse, it it is telling us this. Raise a joyful ruckus to this king, everyone. Now, it doesn't use the word ruckus. Instead, it says, clap your hands, shout unto God. And these are noisy activities, hand clapping and shouting. 
This is noise without instruments. And we, we know that a massive um, crowd is in view because it calls upon all ye people or peoples. Uh, these are the nations of the world that are summoned to clap their hands together as one body, as one group, and to shout to God. Uh, and the uh, second part of verse 1, which says, Shout unto God with the voice of triumph, connotes a joyful, celebratory mood. So, so <laughs> this is an uproar. A happy, celebratory uproar of all the nations of the world gathered together uh, in honor of the sovereign God of Israel. <clears throat> Verse 2. <coughs> Pardon. This verse says, in substance, that this God is the Most High. And it is connected to verse 1 by the use of the word for, which is in almost all the English translations. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord is most high. For the Lord most high is terrible and so forth. In other words, the first reason in the psalm for the nations to raise a ruckus in honor of God uh, to, to raise a joyful celebratory ruckus is that he <laughs> his very person in his person he is the incomparable the most high the God over all the absolute supremely sovereign king and ruler of all uh, now Verse 2 uses the unique biblical name of God. It's indicated by the um, capitalization in our English translations, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh or Jehovah. This is particularly the God that Israel in those days recognized and worshipped. And as we preach this morning, he's the only one that has objective reality. The other gods are... are uh, not gods by nature. Um, only the, the Lord of Israel is the true and living God. And uh, this Jehovah occupies uh, a position described as most high. And, and this, is, this is wonderfully succinct language that uh, has the connotation of um, absoluteness to it. In other words, as one Bible uh, encyclopedia puts it, it means one who is above all things as the maker, possessor, and ruler. He is incomparable in every way. He is subject to no one and no thing. He is the exalted one. You know, there, there, is, there is infinity and, and limitlessness in this use of the adverb this way, most high, the most high. Uh, you couldn't say anything more <clears throat> about his supremacy than this. He is further called the great king of all the earth. Clap your hands, all ye peoples. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Um, again, this is the analogy of monarchical supremacy. Uh, and it is uh, not just Lord over Israel, but Lord over all the earth. As there's no realm in the created order that doesn't have God as its great king ruling over it. And uh, when it says that this great king over the, all the earth is terrible... It doesn't mean that he is bad. We use the word terrible now to uh, mean bad. How do you like my, uh, my pasta? P-A-S-T-A. It's terrible. 
We mean it tastes awful. But that's not the sense here. When it says God is terrible, it means he is it's closer, be closer to say he is terrifying. He is the God who, like no other being, inspires reverence and godly fear and awe. So the <clears throat> scholarly resources on the Hebrew uh, teach us to think of the term here translated terrible. <coughs> Excuse me. So all you nations, clap and shout joyfully with, with respect to the Lord. And do so, number one, because He is the Most High in His person. And for another reason, we come to verse 3. He will gain our victory. Verse 3 is uh, written from the perspective of an Israelite triumphing over the nations in Canaan and beyond. It says, He, that is the Lord, this, the Most High, the one who is the great King, who is terrifying, who rules over all the earth, this Lord, our Lord and our King, shall subdue the people, that is the Gentiles, under us and the nations under our feet, Israel's feet, in other words, in this historical context. This is the second reason for praise. One of the, it was widely understood in the ancient world that one of the most important responsibilities of a king was to protect and defend his people and their interests. And so this is a perfectly understandable a connection with the kingship of God here. The second reason for his praise is he is a mighty king who wins our victory for us. He is the Lord who gains the triumphant deliverance of his people from all our enemies so that they are no longer any threat to us. In fact, <coughs> what they are and have is Subdued for our interest, for our prosperity, for our honor. And, and you know, this is <coughs> how the Lord had fought for Israel and blessed Israel in redemptive history. Uh, let me show you a couple cross references. Deuteronomy chapter 1122 is relevant here. The scripture says, and this is the Lord. Um, challenging his people with obedience to the covenant terms in his relationship with them and theirs with him. If you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him or cling to him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you. And ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. In other words, I'm giving you all that land. Verse 25, there shall no man be able to stand before you. This is, this is an idiom for saying when you meet the enemy in battle, you're going to be left standing and they will not be able to remain standing against your onslaughts. You're going to kill them, in other words, and they'll be, they'll be out of the way. No man shall be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon as he has said unto you. And of course, that's exactly what happened in their history with respect to the promised land. First Kings chapter four, verse 21. And uh, we saw we saw in Jewish history, not only did the people come under Joshua and conquer the land, but they prospered in the land. 
And in the course of time, not only were the seven Gentile nations in Canaan subdued under Israel, but even the Gentile nations around Israel were subdued to the reign of Israel uh, over them and Israel's king. Second, uh, First Kings rather 4.21 says, And Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river unto the land of the Philistines and unto the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. In other words, he imposed upon them a tribute tax and uh, the, the wealth of the nations around Israel were, were given up under duress and they flowed into Solomon's coffers. And this is how he became so wealthy in his reign. Well, this was God at work blessing his people, gaining the victory for them. And <clears throat> this is the second reason for praise, not just God's regal person, but God's regal victory for his people. And verse four, uh, the third reason is not only will he gain the victory, but he will divide the spoils of war. It says in verse four, he shall choose our inheritance for us. The excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. So Israel had a kind of rags to riches story. They were ragtag bunch, uh, you know, slaves in Egypt, and then wanderers, nomads in the wilderness for 40 years. Then they came into the land they had not owned before. The, they inhabited cities with walls they didn't build, houses they didn't build, gardens they didn't plant, um, vineyards, and, and they became wealthy there. And this, this is because the Lord was good to them. It is the Victorian, victorious king's prerogative and delight after the victory to um, divide the spoils of war as he pleases among his own. And that gift from the king is called here inheritance. He shall choose our inheritance. And you remember when the people entered Canaan under Joshua, after the land was subdued before them, there was the casting of lots and the assignment of land portions to the 12 tribes of Israel. When verse 4 says, um, he shall choose our inheritance, the idea is even the excellency of Jacob, uh, that is the land. The land is the inheritance or the excellency. And this uh, land gift is a manifestation of the king's gracious love for his chosen people. Why does the Lord give us this inheritance? Because we are Jacob. We are the, that's another name for Israel. We are the people that the Lord loves above the other peoples of the earth. We are his loved ones in particular. This is the first part of the psalm concerning the king who promises. Now we come to an exhortation to praise the king who performs what he promises in the second part, starting with verse 5. Line 1, line A in verse 5. Most of these verses have a line A and a line B. If you see it laid out in a nicely um, printed uh, version of the Bible, um, line A then in verse 5 says this, God is gone up with a shout. Now here, this may, and I think probably does, allude to um, at least one event in Israel's history. An event that is recorded for us in 2 Samuel 6. Can you find that quickly? 2 Samuel 6, verse 15. And it is when David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. We read in the passage, So David and all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet 
And you see in verse 5 of the psalm, it says, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Uh, having the connection here of a trumpet in Second Samuel. Uh, it, it helps to appreciate um, that the Ark of the Covenant, that is the golden box with a lid uh, that had four golden rings in the uppermost corners uh, and golden rods that went through those rings, one on each side of the box, was uh, <coughs> one of the symbolic significances of the Ark of the Covenant was it was like a litter. That's the, uh, the term for a portable throne for a king. Uh, a throne that is carried by the king's choice servants. The Ark of the Covenant, as you know, was never to be touched. It was not to be transported on an ox cart, an ox drawn cart. God had designed for the Ark of the Covenant to be covered, carried rather by men, not touching the Ark, but rather touching and holding on to the poles that ran through the rings. So there would be two men in the front, probably two men in the back. And in between this Ark of the Covenant hanging in the middle. And that is very similar in appearance to the portable thrones that were used in ancient times to carry the kings. When they were going up to their capital city in pomp and splendor. And so it symbolizes the uh, transport of Israel's God and their king to Jerusalem, the holy city. It was as if his servants were carrying his throne and the Lord is so holy that the, uh, that the servants were not qualified even to touch the throne itself, but rather must use the rods. It seems clear then that verse 5 <coughs> at least has in mind that day <clears throat> when the throne of the Lord was carried into Jerusalem with much fanfare, with the people uh, shouting joyously and blasting trumpets announcing his arrival. <coughs> <coughs> and of course, when it says God is gone up with a shout, this is language that is used with respect to traveling to Jerusalem. First Kings chapter 12, verse 28, because there was a hill, Jerusalem was settled on a hill. Uh, first Kings 12, 28 uses the same expression. Whereupon, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Israel. Everybody talked about going to Israel, that, to Jerusalem rather. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Everybody talked about going to Jerusalem that way. You go up to Jerusalem. doesn't matter whether you're coming from the north or the south, the east or the west. So, this God is portrayed as arriving to be with his people in the heart of their dwelling place. And as soon as that announcement is made, we have the exhortation in verse 6, sing his praises. And this is very unusual that the exhortation is repeated four times like this in one verse. It, it conveys something of the exuberance that attaches to this ministry of, of praising God. Sing praises to God, verse 6 says. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises. We emphasize in our speaking by raising our voice louder, or we emphasize in writing with bold face print or underlining. But in the Hebrew Old Testament, that the stock um, convention for emphasis is repetition. And so a fourfold repetition of the exhortation to sing praises is extreme emphasis. That's what we have here. An extremely 
demanding, uh, uh, extremely uh, important uh, duty that the people have when the Lord is coming into their midst, and that is to sing praises. The Hebrew words <coughs> so translated sing praises mean to offer praise to God using one's voice as an instrument. And of course, that's what singing is. <coughs> singing is different than speaking. It's different than shouting. Singing is musical. And so musical praise, I believe, is in view here. <coughs> now, just like in the first part of the psalm, when following the exhortation to praise this this God, God as we should, um, immediately following is the justification for the praise or the reasons for it. And the reason in verse 7 is that he is the worldwide king. Specifically, the verse reads, For God is king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Uh, or the marginal reading says, Sing praises everyone who has understanding. In other words, the reign of Israel's sovereign God is, is boundless. His kingdom has no limits to it. And uh, then, as if that weren't clear enough, verse 8 continues by saying, He reigns over all the nations. God reigneth over the heathen. That uh, means the non-Jews in, in this historical context. All the other peoples of the world besides Israel, God reigns over them. And it says further, uh, by the way, one paraphrase says God reigns over all the world here. And then it says in second half of verse eight, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. Now, listen, this is an example of of. Um, where we must be careful in our interpretation of biblical statements about God. It says God sits here. And this is anthropomorphic. It is to describe God in terms as if God were a man that had a physical throne and posterior to place in the throne. But of course, it's figurative language. It doesn't mean that God literally, physically sits on an object called a throne. Is there anybody here that would debate that with me? I don't, I don't think anybody would. But God, you see, all of this is analogical language. It's drawing a comparison to teach us something about God. What is the scripture here teaching us about God when it says... He sits upon his throne, the throne of his holiness or his holy throne. Well, this is analogical language, comparison language that conveys this abstract idea. Invincible settledness in exercising supreme authority in perfect righteousness and equity or fairness. God reigns, and God reigns justly, admirably, in wisdom, in truth, in righteousness, without fault, without flaw, without defect, without inadequacy. God reigns over all peoples of the world, you see. And, and this is a striking thing to come in the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures because it is a <coughs> really a rebuke to the henotheism of the Gentiles. Now, <clears throat> I've pulled out a technical term, henotheism. I've used it before, but I want to explain what it means. And you'll, you'll be able to understand this immediately if you don't know the term already. Henotheism was the belief in the ancient world that each nation had its own gods. That it was that there was a god for the Moabites and a god for the for the uh, Ammonites 
and a God for the Babylonians and a God for the Assyrians and indeed a God for Israel. But the, the difference here is that the Israelites knew by divine revelation that their God, the God worshipped in their land, was the only true and living God who actually reigned over all the nations. So there, Israel's God was not a local deity. Israel's God is the deity who created everything and rules over all. He reigns over all nations. And finally, the psalm <coughs> says most beautifully, he gathers all his subjects together. In verse 9, the princes of the people are gathered together. That is gathered by God, of course. Even the people of the God of Abraham, <coughs> they're gathered together. Uh, <coughs> For the shields of the earth belong to God, he is greatly exalted. Now, this describes and envisions a time when the peoples of all the nations of the world are gathered together as God's people, as God's beloved people. And they, on their part, offer up joyful and willing worship to the one true and living God. The God who formerly was associated with Old Testament Israel, but is now recognized by all the nations of the world as the only true and living God. The God of Jews and the God of Gentiles. When, the, when verse 9 says, even the people of the God of Abraham, it might be more helpfully rendered even as. So that the sense goes like this. The princes of the Gentiles are gathered together, even as the people of the God of Abraham are gathered together. You see? In other words, the princes of the Gentiles are gathered just like the, 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 the Jews are gathered to God. And the Gentile princes clearly are representative of their many Gentile subjects. The word shields is here used in a figurative way. To, rep, to, to mean the princes that are here mentioned in verse 9. Because the shield is a symbol of that kind of uh, princely position. <coughs> the shields are the rulers of the peoples. And the point is that all of them belong to their creator. And God has a plan to subdue all the nations to his sovereign authority. And to make peoples from all the nations, his own willing, joyful subjects in his wonderful kingdom. And the climax of Psalm 47 is that this God of Abraham is the one greatly exalted. All right, so those are the nine verses. I think I haven't left a stone unturned in terms of the interpretation of each phrase and word and all the verses. We've worked our way through the psalm. But I can't stop there not and be faithful to the whole counsel of God in Scripture because Psalm 47 is a wonderful testimony to Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ as the sovereign God who is to be praised by all the nations. And I hope you've already anticipated this line of thinking about Psalm 47. It is, it is standard in the history of Christ's church. It is customary to interpret Psalm 47 as a messianic psalm that pertains to Christ. Luther said this psalm was a prophecy of Christ. John Gill wrote that Psalm 47 is of Christ's, it's speaking about Christ's ascension to heaven and the spread of the gospel. When it says in verse 5, God is gone up with a shout. This was a prophecy according to Gill that the Lord Jesus Christ, having fulfilled his earthly mission, would ascend up to heaven and sit upon his throne to the great accolades of the holy beings in God's creation. Um, many others in the history of the church viewed Psalm 47 as messianic. And there, there are many good reasons 
to, to think that it is messianic from the principle of the analogy of Scripture. That simply means that God authored the whole Bible and that each text in the Bible should be interpreted in the light of the rest of the Bible. Surely you recognize that as a valid interpretive principle that not only is there an immediate context for any scripture passage we might choose, but it it is set in the context of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, although written by many men in history, still one divine author who gave the words through those men. And therefore, since God is the author of the whole Bible, uh, the Bible is one and the Bible is internally consistent. If we want to know the meaning of any one scripture uh, that is somewhat obscure, we gather and gain that understanding of what that verse or passage means by comparison of all the relevant passages that are clear uh, with respect to the doctrine under or the passage under review. So it is with Psalm 47. It ought to be understood (coughs) with the whole Old Testament and the whole New Testament in mind. (coughs) In his excellent commentary on the Psalms, The Treasure of David, Charles Spurgeon wrote on this psalm, Whether the immediate subject of this psalm be the carrying up of the ark from the house of Obed-Edom to Mount Zion, or the celebration of some memorable victory, it would be hard to decide. As even the doctors differ, that is the teachers, the great teachers, who shall dogmatize? Since there's a difference of opinion, in other words, concerning whether Psalm 47 is about the bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem or some other memorable victory of Israel. But then Spurgeon says, it is very clear that both the present sovereignty of Jehovah and the final victories of our Lord Jesus Christ are here fitly hymned, H-Y-M-N-E-D, while his ascension as the prophecy of them is sweetly gloried in. Now, I hope you're not skeptical, but even if you are about the Christological focus of Psalm 47, I would, uh, I would show you the biblical case for that. Uh, first of all, we, we ought to notice in Psalm 47, by comparing other scriptures, Christ's worthiness of this praise which belongs rightly to God alone. Look at, look at Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. And in, this, in the conclusion of the sermon, I have a number of cross-references. So if you're a Bible page flipper, flip away with me. Isaiah 42, 6. I, the Lord... I'm sorry. It's 42, 8. I am the Lord... That is my name. And of course, this is Jehovah speaking. It uses that very name, Yahweh, here in verse 8. I am Yahweh. That is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. (coughs) Jehovah is jealous for the worship exclusively. Exclusive worship of God's people. Now, Hebrews chapter 1 6 is stunningly clear that this worship belongs to Jesus. Rightly so. When, when God brings in the first begotten into the world, referring to his son, Jesus, God says, And let all the angels of God worship Him. God the Father calls on all the angels to worship the Son. This is the same Lord who speaks in Isaiah 42, 8. My praise I will not give to another. Look at Zechariah 9, 9. 
Minor prophets of the Old Testament. After Haggai. Zechariah 9, nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy King cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Well, this Old Testament passage would have been obscure to us except for the fact that Matthew, the, the evangelist, first book of the Bible named after him, um, quotes the passage and says it's fulfilled in Jesus. Matthew 21. Verses 4 and 5. All this was done. (coughs) And this is the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Matthew says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion. That's a figurative reference to Jerusalem. The, The cities, the ancient cities were portrayed as daughters or women. And Zion, of course, is the prominent hill in Jerusalem where the temple was built. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Quoting Zechariah, plainly so. Look at Mark chapter 15, verse 2 for further confirmation that Jesus deserves the praise reserved for God alone. Mark 15, 2. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering him said, You say it. Which is to say, yes. The Lord takes to himself the title, the king, the king of the Jews. And of course, When he was crucified, a sign was nailed over his head that read, King of the Jews, Luke 19.38. So, when Psalm 47 portrays Israel's king coming to her, and it exhorts the people who are witnessing the event to give him praise, to clap and shout and sing praises to him, All of this we learn in the New Testament is proper for Jesus who came to Jerusalem. He is, as the New Testament identifies him, King of Kings (coughs) and Lord of Lords. It's not only in earthly Jerusalem 2,000 years ago that he is praised this way. Even in heaven, he enjoys the praise of the Holy Ones. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. It says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Language that formerly was used of Israel, and now is used of Christian believers, the church. Revelation 19.16 says further, He has on his vesture or his clothing and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The incomparable one. The one who is sovereign over all and subject to none. These are titles applied in the New Testament to Jesus Christ. And friends, listen. The basic confession of a Christian is an admission of this. From the earliest times, the first expression of faith, Christian faith, that came from converts was this. Jesus is Lord. Which is to say, Jesus is the sovereign Lord and God over all creation. And so Psalm 47 is a call to praise Christ, the King. Now, as I told you from the, from the earliest part of the message, that Psalm 47 is in two parts. 
It's about the king who promises and the king who performs. So we see Jesus has made his promises of salvation and now he is delivering upon them. When the Lord Jesus was taken from the disciples 2,000 years ago, they beheld him ascend physically from, from earth up into heaven. And he was preached as having gone to the Father's right hand, from which place he reigns over all. <coughs> this is the doctrine of the present and the future mediatorial reign of Jesus Christ having fulfilled his earthly mission. Christ's ascension from earth to heaven was his coming to his throne to rule. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus announces his kingship when he says, verse 18, All power or authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world or the end of the age. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> Jesus, God, well, let me, let me use very scriptural language. God made Jesus Lord of all in connection with his triumphant work and his ascension to heaven. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 is another text I want to show you here. Hebrews 8. Now the thing now of the things which we have spoken this is the sum we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. This is talking about the Lord's work following his earthly uh, mission accomplished. John chapter 17, verse 2. Jesus prayed to his father in heaven. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, he's referring to himself, as you, Father, have given me, Jesus, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This power Jesus received from his Father to give eternal life to the elect of God. Look at Luke twenty four forty seven, please. I can't spend much time on any of these verses, but I wanted quickly to run them by you as a justification for messianic interpretation of Psalm 47. Luke 24:47. This is Jesus speaking. Verse 46. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. And to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. And finally, the last comparison text I have for you this afternoon is Revelation 21 verses 22 to 27. It's, it's in the new Jerusalem that the Lord Jesus in his glory dwells. And is, is worshipped by all. Revelation 21. Starting with verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, John says. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Listen. Verse 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. 
And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall be in no wise, uh, there shall rather in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Isn't it perfectly obvious that the accomplishment of Jehovah praised in Psalm 47 that the people of all the nations will joyously shout and clap their hands and sing to His honor. That's God's plan from the beginning. And that plan is accomplished in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and His redemptive work. By the time it's all done, there are people, the elect from all the nations, from the beginning of the world to the end, were gathered together as one holy church given to praise their King, even Jesus Christ, joyfully shouting, clapping our hands, and singing praises to Him. If, if anyone thinks that from the testimony of the Bible, Old and New Testament, that is not obvious, they must be spiritually blind to miss it. Well, we said in the beginning of the exposition that the main point of the psalm is let everyone praise the sovereign God who promises and performs. And we cannot but conclude in the light of all the biblical evidence that Jesus Christ is that sovereign God who promises and performs. So though he is not mentioned explicitly by name in the psalm, Clearly, the import of the psalm, as understood in the light of the New Testament, is this. Let everyone praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, friends, this is what Worldwide Missions is about. The King, even Jesus, is reigning over His kingdom on earth. His kingdom has no boundaries uh, among the nations. It infiltrates and pervades every nation. And this great King Jesus is at work calling His own elect out of all the nations, fulfilling all the promises ever made to God's people, like the ones God made to Abraham, that His posterity shall be like the multitude of the stars in heaven and the sands on the seashore. Missions is about the King summoning His Subjects to, to willing praise and uh, thus fulfilling the, the promise of, of the 47th Psalm. Let everyone praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our mission too, by the way, is to summon everybody to praise the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. So it is and so it shall be by the word of the Lord.